Chapter 2 Sterling felt her head. Her fingers came away warm and wet. There was a ringing in her ears. Something was crackling? A coughing fit overcame her. Smoke. There was smoke. Where there was smoke, there must be a fire. Fumbling with her seatbelt, Sterling managed to unhook herself. The plane was on a forty-degree slant, so she fell onto Jake, who moaned. Sterling looked at him. He was breathing and still alive, however, he was unconscious. Sterling tapped the side of his face, but got no reaction. Jake? She shook his shoulders. Jake? Nothing. With firm resolve, she hauled back and slapped him hard. What the? Jake blinked in surprise. He felt his red cheek with a hand as his eyes focused on Sterling, who was half sitting on his lap. The world was at an odd angle. The plane crashed, she said unnecessarily. How bad are you hurt? Jake dragged in a shallow breath and thought about it. His ribs were very sore, but everything else felt fine. I'll be okay, I think. Is it warm in here? Sterling looked toward the cockpit doorway. Flames were creeping along the frame. Wincing from her knee, she managed to lunge across the tilted aisle and grab the fire extinguisher. Pass. Pull pin, aim at the base of the fire, squeeze trigger, sweeping motion, she muttered to herself as she extinguished the flames. The fumes set off another coughing fit for her and Jake. It took them a while to get their breath. A cold wind swirled through the air, and Sterling reflected that could not be a good sign. She stepped up to the doorway to see where the cold air was coming from. Do you always do that? Jake grunted as he unclipped his seatbelt and slid, landing against the side of the plane with a thump. He grimaced and tried not to curse as a wave of pain took over his ribs. He had been brought up better than that. His mother, Beverly Ramsley, did not allow swearing from her sons. Jake sucked in a slow breath to try to minimize the pain. "'Do what?' she asked distractedly as she realized the entire rest of the plane was missing." It was gone. They were miraculously in the cockpit, which was not in good shape, but in one piece. After the missing cockpit door, there was maybe three feet of plane before complete and empty air, swirling snow, and evergreens came into view. Sterling stared at it, shocked. Say instructions as you do a task, Jake clarified. He gently propped himself up on an elbow as the pain settled into a throbbing. Jake tried to right himself so he could crawl over the pilot chair. Where is Richard? Gone, Sterling replied. He probably disappeared with the rest of the plane. Could that be right? He had been in the cockpit with them. Maybe he was in the snow out there somewhere. Sterling did not know. He could not just be gone. Jake managed to get himself free. He slowly made his way down the aisle to see what Sterling was looking at. His mouth gaped open. The plane! Gone, Sterling reiterated. She was starting to shake. From cold or shock, she did not know. We need to try the radio. Jake nodded and backed away from the missing part of the plane, returning to the edge of the pilot seat. He had an arm around his ribs. He was hurt. Great. They were in a mess of trouble, and both of them were hurt. Sterling limped to the radio and tried to get it to work. Nothing. The battery was dead. Or fried. Or completely missing. She just did not know. We should stay with the plane. They'll send someone to rescue us, reasoned Jake. We are hours off course. They don't know where we are, responded Sterling as she shivered. If we stay, we will freeze to death. We had a fire a minute ago, Jake pointed out unhelpfully. The loss of the fire was now making way for the bitterly cold wind. Sterling looked at him with a glare reserved for people she generally found wanting in the intelligence department. So burning to death is preferable to freezing to death? We are not going to die, he stated resolutely. There has to be some solution to this. There's a solution to everything. It's the way I do business. Everything can be resolved with the right amount of time, energy, resources, and patience. 
tell that to Richard, Sterling thought. She lurched her way back to the cockpit door and had a look. No. What? asked Jake with a frown. The closet with our luggage is gone. Sterling made her way back to Jake. It was only a few feet to walk, but difficult with her knee and the angle of the floor. Her jeans, leggings, extra socks, and fleecy jacket were a thing of the past. With a violent shiver, she looked around. Maybe there was something they could use to keep warm, if she could just find it. What about my coat? wondered Jake. Gone, Sterling repeated the word again. It summed up the situation nicely. Nearly everything was gone. She thought about what to do. I think there were a couple of these silver blankets in the cupboard near the door. The wine. All that beautiful wine was gone. So was any food. Sterling grimaced and made her way back to the cockpit doorway. She pulled open the cupboards that were still there, looking in each to see if there was anything useful. Found the flashlight. Jake called to her as he spotted the item. He nearly groaned as he bent over to pick it up. Slowly straightening, Jake pressed the button. It even works. Considering how dark outside it was, they were going to need it. The question was, did they try to shelter in place until morning, or try to set out on foot as soon as possible? Sterling pulled out the blankets. There were three thin silver blankets. If they had something to stick a blanket to the doorway, then they could stay in the cockpit without freezing to death for a short time. It would be better to stay the night here rather than walking in circles or going the wrong way in the dark. Or meeting wolves or whatever other creatures were out there. Sterling shuddered and tried not to think about it. She had every intention of getting down the mountain rather than freezing to death on its peak. Pulling out items and shoving them around, she found a roll of packing tape. Sterling was not sure what it was doing on the plane, but she intended to use it. Thanking God for this small miracle, Sterling limped back inside the cockpit. Help me with this. With what? Jake got to his feet, standing behind her. Handing Jake the tape, Sterling broke open one of the blankets, freeing it from the plastic packaging. We are going to tape this to the door to prevent the wind from coming in. That way we can stay the night and not freeze. Were you in Girl Scouts or something? Jake asked as he ripped off a piece of tape. No, that would probably be useful right about now, admitted Sterling. What about you, Boy Scouts? Nope, I hated camping, he said as he taped the blanket to the doorframe. That means you went camping? Hopefully you retain something useful that will help us. She pulled the blanket as tight as she could while he leaned over her, taping it. He was right close to her, and Sterling had a moment where it was hard to breathe. She blamed it on the cologne. Men should not smell so good. I learned that I hate snakes, bugs, raccoons, deer, and all other wildlife, and sometimes even my two brothers who excelled at camping. Jake had a sharp breath as he bent to continue taping the side of the door. I learned that fingers do not plug holes in the canoe, gravity was not my friend, and that I hate climbing trees almost as much as I hate horses. Who hates horses? A surprise Sterling had to question. They bite. Jake remembered the occasion with a frown. They also sweep off riders by going under low-hanging branches on trees. That does not sound pleasant. Sterling frowned. His horse obviously had not been trained very well. Her memories of being out in the bush involved bonfires and copious amounts of alcohol as a teenager. Something she was glad she stopped doing. It was an idiotic thing especially when the guys decided to see who could jump the highest over the bonfire. Not great times. It was a miracle no one had gotten burned or killed. It was not pleasant, Jake responded curtly, nor did it probably teach me any real-life skills. What about reading a compass or a map? Sterling asked hopefully. Not that she had a compass, map, or even a starting point. No. He grimaced and hugged his ribs as he straightened. Like I said, nothing useful. Finally, they taped the blanket to the floor. Already it felt warmer in the small space. Jake helped Sterling to her feet, and she had a look at her knee. It was swollen and oozing blood from where she had smashed it against the console. The first aid kit was on the other side of the cockpit door. 
Sterling shrugged. It would not kill her to just leave it for now. She had no intention of going back into the cold until absolutely necessary. You are going to get frostbite in that skirt and those pumps if we have to start walking through the snow, Jake remarked, looking at her calves. Sterling pulled her blanket out of the packaging. I did not make up the uniform requirements. If I had, it would feature much more sensible and less sexist clothing. Is that sexist? Jake inquired. Yes, Sterling stated. A skirt and pumps? Would a man be wearing those to work as a flight attendant? Not likely, unless he were in drag. Jake shrugged. However, I do not think that women and men should try to dress alike each other. It does not really work. We both have roles in society and ways of doing things that are unique. Our uniqueness should be celebrated rather than forcing us to try to be the same. We're not the same. We never will be. I am too tired to get into an argument about that right now, sighed Sterling. Who said we had to argue? asked Jake. She ignored his question and laid her blanket on the floor between the two seats, curving it up at the edges. It was going to be a tight fit for both of them. Sterling laid down and pointed to the space beside her. You go here, and we put the second blanket on top of us. Shared body heat. Jake sighed and carefully lowered himself to the floor. Are you sure the floor is the best spot? Unless you want to try to share a tilted pilot seat. Sterling shrugged. It did not much matter to her as long as she started to get warm soon. You might be able to breathe better sitting up, but we will be colder if we do not share the heat. If I stop breathing, do not do to me what you did to Richard, Jake muttered as he laid down, spreading the blanket over them both. Hey, I tried to save his life, she defended herself. Sterling was squished between Jake and the seat. Wait a minute, what is this? Something hard was digging into her ribs. Sterling managed to squirm around enough to grab the object out of her pocket. A phone! Jake looked at it and her. Mine was in the piece of the plane that is missing. Do you have a signal? Sterling looked at the cracked screen. It was not totally shattered, so hopefully it would work. She turned it on, and the screen came to life in a disjointed mess. Maybe? Jake turned a little so they could both look at the phone at the same time. I think there is a bar. No, it's gone. We could just give it a try anyways. Sterling hit the call button so she could dial a number. Putting in 911, she waited for the call to connect. It did not. A message flickered across her screen and Jake puzzled it together. No signal. No kidding. Sterling sighed and shut off the phone to conserve battery. I'm not too sure it would have helped anyways. We don't even know where we are. What mountain? What state? They should be able to trace the phone, right? Jake frowned. Technology is so far advanced now, you would think they would be able to do that. Not unless it can be triangulated off of three cell towers. The police need permission for that, which I would gladly give. Sterling was starting to feel warmer. Even then, the search area would be massive. We would be extremely lucky to get found. How do you know that? he asked in surprise. I read extensively, improvised Sterling. Truth was, she knew for her job. There had been a police case about a missing child that she had covered, and cell phone coverage with emergency services had been part of her research. Fortunately, the kid had been okay. A rare good news day in the world of negative news. We will just have to keep trying for a signal as we make our way down the mountain, said Sterling. She returned the phone to her pocket. The last thing she needed was Jake seeing her notes or files. Sterling would keep playing the flight attendant as long as possible. She hoped the police would not be mad at her when they were finally rescued. Was impersonating a flight attendant a criminal offense? When I do not arrive at the airport on time, the airline and my brother will notify the proper authorities, Jake said with confidence. They'll start searching for us shortly. We are off course, remember? Sterling hated to put a crimp in his belief, but it was better to be rational about this. At three hours into the flight, we were still over a mountain range when we were to have cleared that within the first hour. At least, she was pretty sure they should have cleared it close to the hour mark. It seemed right to her way of thinking. We must be north of where we started, Jake remarked. 
How do you figure? she wondered. There's snow, he explained. The northern states are starting to get colder for winter. Higher elevations have snow, Sterling responded with a dry voice. We are on a mountain? You don't think we ended up south in Mexico? Jake did not like that thought. Or even north into Canada? I don't think so. If anything, I think we went around in circles for a couple hours before we crashed. Sterling shrugged and yawned. She felt exhausted from all the activity that had been happening. Or maybe she was tired from the bump on her head. That's my hope. Then we'll be closer to where the search and rescue teams start looking for us. What are we supposed to do with a concussion? What do you mean? frowned Jake. I bumped my head, she explained. Do you have a headache, feel dizzy or nauseous? he asked. No, I just am really tired. Sterling snuggled against him. He was warm, and that was all the invitation she needed. Plus, he smelled good. She took in a deep breath. Careful of the ribs, he complained. Sterling rolled her eyes. What a wuss. She yawned again and went to sleep. If you enjoyed Chapter 2 of Stranded with the Billionaire, Book 6 of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for Chapter 3. Consider hitting the share button for this video or others like it to your social media. This helps my algorithm and my channel grow and it's free for you to do. I really appreciate it when you take the time to share my videos, like, or subscribe to my channel. Have a great day and happy reading!